Hey, everybody. So today I'm going to talk to you about Google Mona, which is essentially reinforcement learning with human feedback for reward models. We'll dive very specifically into exactly what Mona does and its innovations as we go through. Starting off with the research paper itself, the research paper is titled Mona Myopic Optimization with Non-Myopic Approval Can Mitigate Multi-Step Reward Hacking. So I understand why they call it Mona. Very simplistically, when it comes to um, training reward models, very specifically with reinforcement learning, so like training them to play video games, those types of things, they tend to cheat, and they tend to cheat the reward. And that's what all of this deals with. Um, and then so very specifically, let's start off and understand the type of models that we're dealing with here, because we're not dealing with what you would think of with regards towards a uh, standard deep learning neural network. What I'm showing here is what I assume that you would think a standard neural network looks like, right? You have your input layers, uh, and then your hidden layers, and then an output layer, um, and then you can have some biased neutron neurons within there. That's generally what this looks like, right? Just input layer, hidden layers, output layer. We're dealing specifically, more specifically, with like um, CNN type models, which process raw visual data. So they're processing, like the you know, in the example of a video game, the actual like inputs, the the image and the video inputs of the video game. So they have to take in um, this input as a convolution, and then so they do, and they take in the inputs and they perform convolutions on the on the input, which is why it's called a convolutional neural network. So uh, it takes in, say, for example, an image of the number two, and then it performs multiple convolutions within this until it can essentially uh, linearize that pattern. And then once it does that and it has a full convolution of the image, it flattens the image. It shrinks it to like one dimension. Um, and then that is what's then passed uh, to the last layer, which would then be uh, your fully connected layer, your out, like right next to the output layer, which would be what you would be used to and what you're looking at uh, up here, right? In our, our previous example of the, the neural network with the connected layers, it's like the same. This end result is where it looks the same. These last two layers, the um, very last right before the output layer and then the output layer itself. Talking very specifically about what reinforcement learning does and how the reinforcement learning algorithm works. Most reinforcement based uh, learning algorithms are based off of PPO or proximal policy optimization, where essentially you have an agent within an environment um, and then the agent measures its state versus a reward. And then that's what it's constantly doing, right? It's just constantly, I'm here, uh, my reward for being here is X. I was Prior, I was uh, uh, it was Y, and my reward for that was was Z, and then so my reward now is either higher or lower than it was compared to when I was in Y. So uh, state X is either a positive or a negative state compared to state Y, and really simplistically, that's exactly how it works, right? But the problem within that, as you dive deeper, is that these guys will just, I mean, they will flat out cheat. So that equation, you set it up very simplistically, right? So um, here's, your, here's your environment, here's your current state, and then here's your reward. And then the problem is, is that there can be... Uh, let's call them like optimal ways to hit that reward that you would never think of, right? Um, let's say that you, um, a, a random game of uh, like Pong, for example, right? With the paddles going back and forth. And then you set your reward. Um, okay, if you just like, if the ball hits the paddle, uh, then that's reward and that's your reward state, right? And then so you do that. But maybe the model figures out within that just by like tweaking the um, paddle to the upper left, like right um, 0.75 seconds before the ball comes, that that's actually the um, maximum way to get the maximal reward with the minimal uh, energy uh, and so that's what the model will do, and it'll just do that. Uh, and then so it'll train for that reward and for that outcome. And that would be an outcome that a human would never be able to predict. 
right? You would never be able to predict that um, 0.75 seconds before the ball flies to um, the very left hand, like the, like one pixel off of the very left hand corner, um, that all of a sudden that's what ends up being the peak reward value. And then so, but the model will, right? The model will figure that out. And so whatever that actual optimization is, that's what the model goes for. Uh, like a key thing to to like think of within this, right? Like uh, so, when you're dealing with like video games, like Atari games, things like that, they always have rules and and um, guidelines like to follow within the game, right? This is how you like the rules of the game. To the model, those are just environmental obstacles. Can it overcome those environmental obstacles? If yes, it's going to bend them. And so it's not going to pay attention to your rules of your game in anywhere near the same instance that you are. It's environmental obstacles to them. Can it overcome them? Can it get around them? That's what it's going to try to do. And then so this introduces the um, kind of the opposite concept. So reinforcement learning with human feedback is not the same at all as reinforcement learning. And I think like people bundle these things, right? Like it's easy to think of reinforcement learning or RL as being the exact same as RLHF or reinforcement learning with human feedback. And they are two very different and distinct concepts. This um, reinforcement learning operates off of PPOs, proximal policy optimization, right? So essentially we have our environment and our state, and that's all we're doing is we're doing it uh, based off of environment and state. Whereas with uh, RLHF, we're typically dealing with models that deal with text um, or um, don't deal very specifically with an environment. So there's no um, environment and state to um, match them towards. But what instead we're matching them towards is um, human feedback, like like uh, what I want the model's reward to be. Um, so whatever that, di uh, I dictate whatever that is, right? And then so how you do that for, um, let's say like an LM model, is you take your initial prompts data set, which is, let's say uh, a dog is Etc. And then you train your initial model. So you train the one model, and then it will say um, a, a dog is a, a furry mammal. It will be the output from that. And then um, from there, you say, no, I want you to say a dog is a man's best friend. And then so you uh, correct the model's um, output uh, based off of that, right? And then so based off of that, so, uh, the model is then it trained again, um, and then a reward model is generated based off of that. So you're uh, training multiple models uh, by the end of RLHF is really how it breaks down, and, and especially how Mona breaks down within this instance, right? Um, but so this is the typical RLHF framework that we're looking at here. And then you do... Uh, you can incorporate that PPO update uh, into this once you have uh, into your uh, uh, reward preference model. But you can see the difference here is that you're not never interacting with the environment, right? It's uh, prompts are inputted. The model gives an, an input and output. You say hey, it's wrong. Here's how it should be right. Here's the corrected response. Back propagate and train does model on the corrected response. You then get a reward model that can be then utilized based off of that. And then you can utilize the reward model to then further train and optimize the initial inputs from your other models. And it kind of acts as like a chain in a sequence, right? And there you go, RLHF in a nutshell. Mona takes this a step further. Um, and then so this is the architecture of Mona. Um, and then really the best way to uh, think of this is it's really a blend of um, RLHF and RL, right? And, and they're doing a blend of that. And then they're also adding two reward functions. And then I, I think of that overall and you have Mona. So the two reward functions are a, a myopic reward a myopic reward and a non-myopic reward. Myopic being uh, like uh, like what is the present and then non-myopic being like what would be matter in the future, uh, in the future state. And then so I think of this like, um, let's say that you're playing uh, Pac-Man uh, and then uh, the model goes left and then left is good because uh, that moves you um, 
towards uh, it just it's a movement so it, as far as um, immediate rewards it doesn't and it hit you towards anything so it's a good immediate reward but let's say that um, in the long term if you look at five moves to the left let's say there's a ghost five moves to the left <laughs> and then so moving to the left when you incorporate that long-term reward would be bad for the model overall as opposed to moving right where you wouldn't have a ghost in this model in this example right um and then so if we're looking at just the short-term reward moving left would be rewarded because it wouldn't look at the ghost the ghost is just not a part of that equation because it's five moves away if we incorporate a long-term reward that says, hey, there's a ghost um, five moves to the left, so you just moved closer to the ghost in your future state, then that's going to make a negative long-term reward. And then so your positive short-term reward computes along with your negative long-term reward model starts to curve away. It changes its behavior based off of that, right? And then that's in a nutshell, what you've done. You've changed the model's behavior based off of just introducing this secondary long-term reward as opposed to just the short-term reward. And, and I mean, really that's the the, the kind of the, the bottom line within this. More importantly though, and what I, I am uh, kind of leaving out within that, so the two architectures that I brought up at the top of this video, right? Um, CNN models and LLM models. And very specifically, and generally speaking, for historically, when you're dealing with reinforcement learning, you're dealing with um, reinforcement learning for uh, not LLM models. And then when you're dealing with reinforcement learning with human feedback, you're dealing with that for LLM models. And that's kind of the distinction, right? CNN models are typically R uh, uh, RL, and LLM models are typically RLHF. And then what we're seeing in more and more instances, though, is a kind of like a blending and a blurring of those lines. We can see uh, in recent instances, like, for example, like the DeepSeq architecture is utilizing reinforcement learning to train LLM models um, in that particular instance. Right? And then that's kind of how it's, it's um, that basis of that architecture. And that's kind of one of the... Uh, kind of key advancements of that is reinforcement learning specifically within the LLM architecture. Think of Mona as kind of the opposite of that, right? Um, Mona is RLHF for your CNN model, which is like, like a, it's a major kind of breakthrough and uh, not a way that the DeepMind paper illustrates or breaks this down very specifically, Because, but I mean, that's essentially what this model does uh, and how I look at it overall and why I think that this is pretty significant overall, right? Um, and then so kind of the key findings that the authors find from this paper, they empirically demonstrate three claims. The first is that ordinary reinforcement learning can cause multi-step reward hacking while Mona can prevent it without any additional supervision. So by utilizing this particular method, they solve that um, models can be cheaters problem, right? Which is huge. And then, so that's the like the big thing that they outline within their paper. Two, improving the approval foresight improves the policy learned by Mona, but even noisy foresight can work well. And the authors, like, this is the part that they um, are, like, they're, like, focusing on one instead of two, whereas uh, all throughout this video and, and throughout this explanation, I've been focusing more on two. To me, two is more important within this than one. Uh, two allows us to essentially uh, prove and utilize that this framework is useful for, uh, like, for CNN models and for traditional models, right? It allows us to do RLHF. Um, it adds a, another lever, and an RLHF lever, for um, traditional rewards models that we wouldn't have. It's RLHF for rewards models, which is pretty significant. Like, two is more significant to me than one. Uh, and then three, when approval feedback depends on outcomes, multi-step reward hacking can occur despite myopic optimization, which is important, right? So three is just saying that there's... Um, uh, holes within this that, that you can um, bypass this that it has limits right that you like there's not like uh, the model is still going to cheat like let's I mean just going back up to here these models are like it's, it's going to cheat right <laughs> this guy if you give them 
any out, outlet to cheat whatsoever, he's going to find it. And then uh, this is just saying that like even with this architecture with incorporating these long-term and these short-term reward models, that there are still instances where you give this guy avenues to cheat. Um, and then so um, this is Google Mona in a nutshell. I'll leave a link to the description of the actual paper and the link of this video and if you like a description of this video and if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.